All right, we have just a few more things to discuss. Um, I mean, one of these dilemmas is uh, kind of important, so it's not like we're just doing like really small stuff like this. It's still all important. It's just we're nearing the end. So given x and x, we're going to define x to the g uh, to be the collection of all points in x that g fix. So this is kind of like, well, earlier we had the, the stabilizer of a point x, which was a collection of elements in g that fix a particular x. Now here, uh, given a, an element g in big G, we're considering the elements in x such that g fixes that point. So uh, it, it's kind of it's kind of like the stabilizer, but from the x's perspective, or so, something like that. Um, so this is the collection of um, appropriately named fixed points. points for G, uh, where G is an element of big G. Ugh, spacing is horrible, but whatever. Lemma. This is Burnside's lemma, and apparently Burnside was a mathematician, I want to say it was early 1900s or late 1800s, and he wrote a textbook on group theory, and he said, like, he had this lemma in there, and he was like, this is a really well-known lemma, and he didn't, he didn't like credit it to someone, he just said it was really well-known, but that turned out to be, like, moving forward, the best source for that lemma, so it just became Burnside's lemma. Even though he didn't come up with it, he just happened to mention it as, in his textbook. Um, I'm pretty sure that's a true story. I heard it from a professor, I think. Yeah, I'm, yeah I heard it from a professor, uh, so it's probably true, hopefully. So, anyways, the order of, or the, the, the number of orbits um, that we get from this action is equal to 1 over the order of g of the sum of the size of x to the g. So this is sort of like the number of orbits is equal to the average number of fixed points for like the average g sort of that's that's sort of what this is telling you uh the interesting thing here is that like like we're, we're taking this sum times one over g when you're when you're just looking at this formula there's no reason to think that it's um like a whole number and it turns out it is because it's equal to the number of orbits so anyways, let's prove this. So we're going to let f, oh, that was a little loud, be the collection of pairs gx in g cross x such that gx equals x. And what we're going to do is we're going to compute the size of f and we're going to do it in two ways. And that will give us what we're looking for. Um, so size of f equals, OK, so if we count it, let's hear, for every single g, um, Yeah, let, let's let's take uh, so the sum overall g and g, and then what are we going to get if we consider some element of g? Then f is going to contain um, the elements of x that g fix, and so well the collection of elements of x that g fixes is x to the g. And now why is this? What so is it obvious that the sum is disjoint, i.e. that uh 
these fixed points are disjoint. So if we have, let's say we have two different elements of G. Um, if, if G1 fixes X and G2 fixes X, um, And yeah, it doesn't. Oh, oh yeah, of course it doesn't matter because this is just ordered. Yeah, I, I'm getting caught up in something that doesn't matter. This is just ordered pairs g x. So if you were to just look at, um, whenever you look at, so every time you look at a distinct element g in capital G, you're going to have, you you just want to count the number of x's that you could possibly get, and that's of course going to be. The, num the, the fixed points. Okay, so that, that's if, if we, if we uh, look at the elements of G and then count how many elements of X we get here for each associated element of G. Uh, what if we do the other thing? What if we uh, take the sum over all X and X? So uh, for every single x and x, how many possible pairs of this form are we going to have? Well, we're going to have one every time we have a gx, which equals x. So for every element of g that stabilizes x, so this is just going to be the stabilizer of x. Let's see here. So, okay, so that's good. So, so then this sum equals this sum, but that doesn't give us what we want. Uh, what we want is we want to look at, let's see here. So, let's see here. We know that g of x is equal to g divided by the stabilizer of x. And, of course, everything I just said is with norms. Let's see here. So, let's see here. So, f. And norm is equal to the sum of the stabilizers. But we can replace that with, uh, let's see here, if we move the stabilizer over to this side and move that over to that side, then that's going to get the sum over all x and x of uh, the norm of g over the norm of the orbit of x under g. But Okay, so let's see here. How 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 else can we write this? So Now we we want to get at these orbits here. So um if we think about what happens if we consider any two Oh, this is this is bad. This is not this that does not look good. X's just are bad in general because lower because X's are used all the time and lowercase X and uppercase X look identical and it's horrible. But uh, anyways, so if we have two elements of X which are in the same G orbit, then it's going to give you the same thing. So we can actually sum, we can index our sum using the G orbits because... Uh, we can just choose some, for, for every single x in a g orbit, we could just choose some element of that, uh, some representative of that orbit and consider g times that chosen element rather than considering g times x for every single x. So we're, we're, sort, of, we're sort of consolidating our x alphas together uh, in this next step here. So then x in alpha of g mod uh g times x so remember um so for every alpha in g mod x we're going to get so alpha is a collection of fixed uh it's an orbit in x so it's a subset of x and so then we have to consider elements little x of this orbit alpha okay so that's this but like i was saying earlier um Instead of just considering this this orbit g of x, we could just that that just is the size of alpha, right? Because every the the orbit of every single element in this orbit, yeah, the the the, the order of the orbit of every single element in this orbit is going to be the same thing. It's just going to be 
but just you could just say the order of alpha. And so that's exactly what we're going to say. So this is um, the sum over all alpha in g mod x of um, g mod, let's see here. So now we, for every single element of alpha, we do this. So if we, so here, let, let's, let's, let's write this in two steps. So the sum over x and alpha of g over the order of alpha. Um, but of course, how many x's are in alpha? Well, that's just going to be the norm of alpha. So, and uh, for every single x in here, th this expression doesn't depend on x. So we can just write this as the sum over all alpha in g. I think I, ke I, think I keep saying g mod x, and I mean uh, in the g orbits of x. Um, instead of the sum here, we can just multiply this by however many elements are in here. So that is alpha times g divided by alpha. Oh, well, hey, look at that. Um, this is just the sum over alpha in g orbits uh, in x of the order of g. Um... But how many alphas are we summing over here? Well, that's just the number of the order, or the number of orbits that we have. So that's equal to just this times this. Uh, okay, so thus, ugh, it looks pretty bad. So, okay, so way back over here, we have the sum over all g and g of x to the g is going to equal the order of f. Sure, I'll write that in. Uh, we're not taking up much space there. But that is equal to, using this whole equality thing, that's going to be equal to the uh, number of orbits times g. And now we just divide by the orbit of g on each side. And hence, Um, we conclude that the number of orbits is equal to 1 over the order of g times the sum over all g and g of the collection of the size of the collection of fixed points of g. And there we go. That is Burnside's lemma. And we're almost done. Um, I hate to erase something that I've just proven, but have to do it because we need more space. It'd be really nice if I had more board space, but it'd also be really nice if, I don't know, a lot of things. So, just gonna erase this. But yeah, so this is an interesting proof, and it's not one that comes up a lot in exercises, I don't think. Um, but it is one that it's good to be aware of, because I don't know how else you would go about proving this without using this counting exercise. And there, there, there are proofs that you will come across in, like later on in algebra, that kind of use the same idea of like, oh, let's count this set in two different ways, and then put those things equal to each other. Um, but I'm not sure how often those things come up in exercises. Okay, so let's end with some facts. Um, G acting on X is transitive if and only if uh, the size of the orbit or the, the number of orbits is one. That's just kind of obvious because to be transitive means that you can get from any point to another, any point of x to another one by a group action. So if you consider the orbit, you can get because you can get anywhere. The orbit is the whole, all of x. So there's only one orbit. And similarly, if there's only one orbit, then you can get from anywhere to the, anywhere else. Okay. Uh, so that's that's a condition for transitive. Uh, what about the others? It is free. 
if and only if the collection of fixed points of G let's see here we know that um, free means that the collection of fixed let me let me make sure I don't uh, mess anything up free means that um, if you choose any point in X um, if G fixes that point then G is the identity so the collection of fixed points if if G is uh, not the identity then the collection of fix, fixed points has to be empty so uh, the fixed points of G un, under the uh, action of the element G is empty whenever G is not equal to E um, then it is what's the other one faithful nope oh, I guess we don't do that one So what happens if our group action is transitive and free? If it is transitive and free, then what? Then by Burnside's lemma, which we just did, uh, so What's, what's the equation going to look like? So g mod x, well, let's see here, it's transitive, and so that's just 1. It is going to be equal to 1 over the order of g times the sum over all g and g. Um, fixed points. Okay, so if we're considering... If we sum over all the non-identity elements, then the size of x to the z is going to be 0. But when we consider the uh, the identity element, we have um, it's going to be no 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 no. What is what is the size? What is the size of that thing? Uh, the next thing is going to be um, the the fixed points under the identity element. And what does the identity element fix? It fixes everything in X. So you have to remember, well, I have to remember where these things live because I was about to mess that up. So anyways, okay, so if we reduce this, what is this? This is just x over g. And so size of x equals the size of g. And that's actually really interesting because you know that there, we really don't know anything about the relation between g and x. Um, so it's nice that we can actually relate them in some way if we know something about uh, the group actions. Okay? Um, there's, there's just an example at the end there. I don't think it adds too much, so I'm just going to stop here. But anyways, yeah, that's... Burnside's Lemma and an application of Burnside's Lemma.